Some of you uh, may remember I spoke a few weeks ago about praying for salvation, um, and we had a number of weeks when we met um, in the early morning to pray specifically around seeing more salvation, seeing more fruitfulness. You may also have noticed a regular feature that we've introduced into our Sunday gatherings that we're now praying each week um, for people to be saved and added to us. There's a longing in our heart um, to see the fruit of this gospel that's changed our lives, um, touching the lives of people around us uh, as well. Well, as part of that message, I preached for us, uh, I, I read some um, famous verses from Matthew chapter 9, and they've really stuck with me ever since, and I've not been able to get them out of my head. And so I'm going to um, start there this morning, Matthew chapter 9, from verse, verses 35 um, to 38. Matthew chapter 9 and verses 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Well, just a quick explanation for any of you who are new amongst us. I know some of you have heard me explain this so many times. But this kingdom that Jesus is going around proclaiming the good news of the kingdom It's the rule and reign of God. It's God having his way in our world. And God's kingdom looks like love. And it looks like justice. And it looks like peace. It looks like um, people not living in poverty but needs being met and provided for. It looks like life as God always intended and created it to be. Jesus says this rule and reign of God... It was, it, the, the bad news was it was lost to us because we all decided as human beings to go our own way, do our own thing. We didn't need God in our lives uh, and basically our world became corrupted and broken and the Bible is the whole story of how God wants to restore this beautiful kingdom to the ends of the earth. And that story reaches its climax in Jesus coming into our world and he says the kingdom has now come close to you Because what I'm about to do in giving my life on the cross, in my body being broken and my blood being shed like we've remembered at the table this morning, in that moment when Jesus died on the cross, for all who would put their hope and trust in him, he was paying the price. He was paying the price of our rejection of God and making it possible for us to embrace his rule and reign in our own lives. And by embracing his rule and reign in our own lives, by coming into his kingdom ourselves, he enables us to be part of establishing that kingdom to the ends of the earth. By saying, I want to live under the rule and reign of King Jesus, I can be part of seeing a whole world filled with the beautiful, loving, gracious, compassionate rule and reign of King Jesus. So Jesus goes around demonstrating that. He's healing the sick. He's proclaiming this good news. You can know God. You can live in relationship with him. You can be part of the beautiful things that he's doing in our world. Instead of your life counting against the will of God and what he wants to accomplish. And all the goodness and the righteousness and the peace. Instead of your life working against that, you can know what it is to be reconciled with God. To be in a great relationship with him. And to be part of what he's doing In our world. And Jesus says there's no shortage of harvest. There's no shortage of people who are actually ready to give their lives to him. There is no shortage of harvest. There are people around you in your life. You might not know exactly who it is at what time it is. And that's why we just faithfully go on proclaiming the good news to everyone we can. But there are people around you who God is drawing to himself. That's what the word of God tells us. That's what Jesus tells us. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And this is what's really been grabbing my attention over the last few weeks. The workers are few. Now, if you speak to church leaders, 
the, the immediate thing that our mind goes to when someone says the workers are few, if we're honest, is the fact that week after week we make appeals for more children's workers, more um, hospitality team, more stewards. We have challenges, we have events on in the building and we don't have enough people just to sit on reception and man the door so that we can keep this building safe. It's a complicated building to keep open and keep safe and we need people to volunteer or whether it's people to help with the, um, you know, audio visuals, or, you know, week after week, I see Kalani, God bless him, running around um, for hours before the meeting. He's supposed to be leading us in worship, but he's, you know, doing all practical setup things, and, you know, so you speak to church leaders, and I'm not just talking about us here in this church. Um, I've got lots of great friends right across this city um, in leadership in different churches, um, and everybody is saying the same. In fact, since the pandemic, everybody wants to stay at home. Um, we got used to staying at home. We had that message um, rammed home to us, didn't we? I think there's a slide for this one. Um, we had that message ran, rammed home to us again and again, stay at home. And I think somehow it sunk in. I think somehow it stuck. And, and even though we know that we don't have to stay at home anymore, we kind of got used to it and we like staying at home. You know, it is kind of frustrating that so often the first thing I get asked when we talk about we're having such and such a meeting is, is it going to be live streamed? <laughs> Can I just not bother to come out and stay at home? Now, I'm not judging anyone because I know you might have really good reasons for staying at home. I know that it might not be practical. I know there might be childcare issues. I know that you might not be well enough to come out. There are all kinds of good reasons. That's why we do the live streaming and we really appreciate all the people that are involved in making that happen. It's a great thing to be able to do. But when our kind of like first instinct is, I just want to stay at home. Or I just, you know, I, I don't know, I don't feel. We, what we've noticed, and again, right across the church, this seems to be a challenge, is that people just don't seem to be up for volunteering in the same kind of way to the same kind of extent as before. We've got some great people helping out and working really hard. The problem is, whenever you say anything like this, the people who are working like crazy, start feeling bad, and they say, oh, we need to work even harder. And everyone else goes, oh, great, they'll do it. <laughs> but I want to be honest, there is a challenge right now. There is a challenge for those of us organizing the life of church. There's a challenge because in that sense, the workers are few. There's a real challenge. People don't want to come out to meetings midweek anymore. Um, you know, it, it, it just shows us something. Again, I know there's all kind of reasons. Life is really busy these days. Life is really hectic. I think the pandemic showed us that there were some other ways of doing things. There were some other possibilities. Um, you know, there were challenges around um, activities that were on Sundays before the churches were open. The outside sports activities were going on. And now there's the challenge of like kids that got used to doing that and they want to still get involved in that. I know it's challenging. But I've noticed that whereas like the people that used to come every week, some of those people come maybe every other week to church now. And the people that come every other week used to come every other week to church. Maybe they come once a month now. And so I'm not condemning anyone. You get that, right? I'm not, you know, I know you've all got, I'm not looking at anyone in particular because you've all got your individual situations. You've all got your own stuff going on. I'm just observing something that's going on in the life of the church. But of course, Jesus wasn't really just talking about people to operate the cameras or set up the um, you know, the, the projection or to um, you know, um, serve the teas and coffees. He was talking about, you know, all of those things can play their part, but he was talking about what you do in your midweek, what you do in your workplace, what you do in your community, the way you live your life. So actually, the last thing we want is just to make you all be at King's house all the time and not around the people who need Jesus in the world around you. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I want everyone to be here putting on meetings and, uh, and doing things in this building. Actually, what Jesus is talking about is he's talking about workers who say, I want to live my whole life so that people hear the good news about Jesus. I want everything about the way I live my life to touch the lives of people around me. 
I want the way I do marriage. I want the way I do singleness. I want the way I um, treat my friends. I want the way I interact in the workplace. I want the way I worship. I want the way I have fun. Um, I want everything about my life to tell the story of the goodness of God, of the relationship that I enjoy with him, with the difference that that makes to my life because I live my life under the rule and reign of King Jesus. And therefore, my heart longs for the justice and the righteousness and the peace and the joy that he longs to fill the earth. But people don't want to commit to as much. And rotors go unfilled. Attendance at meetings is quite often low. Jesus in Luke 4, 43, when, when he was preaching the gospel and um, the people in Capernaum where he was preaching, they wanted him to stay. And he said, no, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, because that is why I was sent. He had this sense of, I've got to keep on doing what God has sent me to do. He had this sense of, I can't just fill my life with the things that I want to fill my life in, but I've got a mission, I've got a purpose, I've got a destiny to fulfill, and my life is all about that. He lived with a sense of abandonment. My life is laid down and given over to the purpose for which God has sent me into this world. Jesus expects us to be fruitful in his kingdom. Again, a passage that we've read together many times, but let's turn there again to John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Jesus is determined that you and I should be fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I also, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in, you, in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in, my, in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Notice, by the way, the context of asking for whatever you wish is so that you can show that you are disciples of Jesus and bear much fruit and bring him glory. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus is not saying, I need you to remain in me so that you can be obedient because I want your life to be miserable. Jesus is not saying, I want you to give up everything that could possibly bring you joy in your life so that you can be miserable for me, and that will bring honor to me. No. Jesus is saying, I love you so incredibly much, and I want you to stay in that love. I want you to enjoy that love. When you enjoy that love that I have for you, it will produce obedience in your life, and you will have incredible joy. Your joy will be complete when you remain in the love of Jesus. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. You see, remaining in the love of God and loving God with all of our hearts and therefore loving the people around us 
will produce fruitfulness in our lives. That's what Jesus says. It will produce fruitfulness. Jesus is determined that you should be fruitful. Jesus expects fruitfulness from your life. He's not disinterested. Do you remember the fig tree that didn't bear fruit? Jesus cursed it. It withered and died. He expects fruitfulness in your life. But this is not some harsh requirement that you're not able to live up to. Because he says, all you've got to do is remain in my love. All you've got to do is remain in the love of God and it will produce fruitfulness in your lives. You didn't choose God. You didn't choose God. You're not trying to make something happen for God. He chose you and he poured out his love in your life. And all you've got to do is respond to that love. In Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, If you um, go home and read those three chapters, you find three incredible chapters all about the purpose of God's church. In Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, it talks about the mystery of his will that's been made known, that was kept secret in ages past, that was brought to fulfillment at the right time, that all things in heaven and on earth should be brought together under one head, even Christ. That everything should be brought together under the kingship of Jesus. That that was God's amazing plan and purpose. And then in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, we're told that the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So God's got this plan that everything will come together in Jesus, but then he says it's the church that will be the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In Ephesians 3, um, verse 10, it tells us that his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. It's amazing the plan and purpose that God has for the church. And you can think of the church as this institution that's somehow separate from you, but that's not the way it is. You're the church. You're the church. There is no church without Christians. You're the Christians. You're the church. You are the church. God's intent was that now, through you, the manifold wisdom of God... The multifaceted wisdom of God. All the brilliance and genius of God should be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms through you. That was his intent. So it's a pretty big deal, right? This incredible mystery that was kept hidden for thousands of years through Old Testament history. It's now been made known in Jesus that everything should be brought together in Jesus. That God's kingdom would be established to the ends of the earth. That he wants to do that through the church because the church is going to put all of his goodness and his glory and all the wow of God on display. And so Paul then prays in Ephesians chapter 3. And he says, because of all this, because of all this wonderful, amazing plan and purpose, because of this eternal cosmic plan and purpose that he has called you as Christians into. He says, he prays that you will be rooted in. And established in love. Ephesians 3.17. That you will be rooted and established in love. And that you will have power to comprehend all that he's done for us. The power, the authority. But I find that so interesting. All this amazing plan and purpose. But what does Paul's prayer come back to? That we as the church would be rooted and established in the love of That God has for us. And therefore I find it really interesting. Because this is the letter to the Ephesians. The church in Ephesus. You need to be rooted and established in love. I don't know if you remember at the start of the book of Revelation. There are a number of messages to seven different churches. And the church in Ephesus is one of those um, churches that gets addressed. And the risen Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, this is, he, he commends them. He tells them some things they're doing really well. But he says, this is what I've got against you. You have forsaken your first love. The love that you had at first. The love you once had isn't burning as brightly, as strongly as it once was. It's love for God. That will produce fruitfulness in our lives. It's love for God that will cause us to do things that just seem unreasonable 
leaders, um, department heads, team leaders, they can bang on and on and on about, we need more volunteers, I wish people would be faithful, I wish people would turn up. But how many of us know it's when we're passionate about something that it produces the change in our lives? It's when we're motivated. It's when something has captivated and gripped our hearts. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was so excited. There's nothing I wouldn't do. In fact, uh, when I came to university, I was still a young Christian, and um, I, I'd started going to the, the kind of church that I knew from where I'd got saved, and I was finding that difficult. But then a friend at the Christian Union said, well, I go to a church called Covenant Community Church. That's what we used to be called. Um, I used to go to a church called Covenant... Uh, this person said, I go to a church called Covenant Community Church, uh, and, and we have a prayer meeting at 6.30 um, on, a, I think it was a Wednesday morning. And I said, yes, I'll come. I hadn't even joined the church yet. The first meeting I came to here was a 6.30 a.m. prayer meeting. I came to that for two weeks. I thought, wow, these people are crazy. <laughs> they think that God's deaf. And that the louder they shout, the more likely he is to hear them. But there was something about the passion and the excitement and, and the, yeah, the love for God that drew me in. I want to be with these people. And I came here eventually on a Sunday morning and I knew that I had come home. I knew I'd come to where I belonged. And there was an excitement. There was a passion. And I remember that when there was an appeal for people to help out, I was there on my hands. And I'm not telling you this to impress you. There were other people who were doing the same kind of things. But I was there early mornings on my hands and knees scrubbing the carpets in this building. You're welcome. <laughs> but I was on fire. I was excited. I was in love with Jesus. I was excited about what he wanted to do in my life. I remember in my university days, I'm not saying this is the most effective way to reach people for Jesus, but I used to preach to the queue outside of the nightclub in my hall of residence. <laughs> I know that some of you relate to this because you're used to preaching on buses and things like that. You know, you can't do that here. <laughs> preaching to the queue of nightclubs doesn't work that great either. Um, but we tried. <laughs> but I remember being on fire, being so excited. Maybe some of you can remember a time when you felt more excited. When you felt, I don't know, just slightly more in love with Jesus. Slightly more excited about the possibilities, about what he wants to do in you and through you. No amount of us cajoling or laying on guilt trips or trying to make people you know, aware of the need. None of that is really going to produce the change we need in terms of people not just filling rotors, although that would be helpful. Um, but not just filling rotors, but people who are laying down their whole lives, who are saying, do you know what? Yes, I want to I want to knuckle down and do well in my career if that's the thing that God has called me to. Yes, I want to be successful in business if that's the thing that God has called me to. But equally, if God has called me to something else, then I want to do that. Because what matters to us is what God has called me to. How does he want me to produce fruit in my life? How does he want me to serve him? How does he want my life to shine as a witness to his gospel? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he's talking about his own preaching of the gospel, he says, Christ's love compels us. Christ's love compels us. We have... We, we are so in love with Jesus that we can't help it. Not, not someone stood on a platform and said, you really ought to be doing this. And I felt bad because it was like the 10th week that they'd asked. And so I finally thought, well, no one else is going to do it, so I'll do it. No, Christ's love has got hold of our hearts. The love for God that we have burns so strong in us that we're just like, I want to do anything, whatever it takes. I want... God's church to succeed. I want to make him famous. I want to see people come into the kingdom. But you know what? We cannot force people to love God any more than we can force people to join rotors and serve. We can't even force ourselves to love God more. So how could we force anyone else? Have you ever tried that? You ever felt bad? You kind of like, you know, maybe in the beginnings of some kind of conviction, and you know, I'm, I don't want to give too much away here. Maybe it's only me, um, but it's like, oh, 
I just need to love Jesus more. But you can't force it. You can't fake it. You can't manufacture it. Let's read 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4. And from verse um, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and love is made complete in us. This is how how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete amongst us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love the brother and sister who they have not seen, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. We love because he loved us first. We love because he loved us first. That's why we came to the table this morning and we remembered That Jesus Christ, for every single one of you, hung on that cross and suffered rejection from his father and died a painful, agonizing death, carrying on himself the sins of the whole world, your sin and my sin, your rejection of God and my rejection of God, your guilt, my guilt. Your shame, my shame. He carried it all upon himself. And he willingly laid down his life for you. Such was his love for you. Such was his love for you. Such incredible, incredible love. When we just begin to recollect that love, as we... As we pray, God, give me a fresh revelation of your love. Touch my heart a fresh love. I don't want to become indifferent to your gospel. I don't want to become indifferent to the magnitude of what you have done for me. This is the best news ever. We were in rebellion. We'd rejected you. We were going our own way. We turned our back on you. But you reached out in love to us. And you gave your life for us. For the very ones who'd rejected you. For the very ones who'd spat at you. For the very ones who held insults at you. You gave your life for us because you loved us so much. And you promise that this love will never leave me and never forsake me. That nothing in all of creation will be able to separate me from this love that you have for me in Christ Jesus. I need the world to know about this love. I need the world to know about this love. I need more of a revelation because I know it's only a revelation of your love that will produce greater love for you in my heart. I know my heart is fickle. I know my heart can be hard. I know my heart can easily be turned away after other things. And yet I know the only way that I will live passionately and wholeheartedly for you. I know the only way that I will overcome the sin and the temptation that I face in my life. The only way that I can live the life of holiness, of justice, of righteousness and peace that you call me to is when I am wholeheartedly, passionately in love with you, Lord Jesus. 
So Lord, I ask you to give me today a fresh revelation of your love. Lord, not just in words. Not just in words, but a conviction in my heart that turns my heart towards you afresh. In Psalm 51, when David is convicted of sin on an incredible level, he pours out his heart to God and he asks for his forgiveness. He asks him to cleanse him. And he says this in Psalm 51 and verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. We need a fresh revelation of God's love. We need him to restore the joy of our salvation. I believe this is at least in part our response to asking the Lord to send workers into the harvest field. Because we can't force people. I can't force you. You can't force anybody else. It's only a heart conviction that will compel us that will send us into the harvest field. It's when we fall more passionately in love with Jesus that we will run into the harvest field joyfully, joyfully accepting whatever suffering, whatever persecution, whatever obstacles may come our way because we're so in love with Jesus. We can't force that, but there is power in his love. There's power in his love change even the hardest of hearts even the heart perhaps even you may have become frustrated with that fickle heart that so easily is turned away the power of his love can change that heart so let's stand together in the presence of God as the worship team come If you dare this morning, metaphorically, why don't you just place your heart in his hands right now? Change your hearts, Lord. Move upon us by your spirit, Lord Jesus. Lord, where we have been in any way half-hearted, we ask for your forgiveness. We long for that kind of revelation of your love that will change our hearts. We want to love you with all that we are. We want to love you faithfully. We want to produce fruit in our lives that is pleasing to you. So I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would use this moment and the coming days, the coming weeks, Lord God, to move in our hearts as your people, to cause us to fall more deeply in love with you. Lord, where we have forsaken our first love, we don't love you as wholeheartedly as we once did. Forgive us, Lord. Move upon us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name.